big questions that we talked this morning about Nigeria, three uh, uh, talks, so try to be at least within this. It could be beyond the lectures, but within the topic. Okay? Beyond the lecture, that's fine, if we are able to. And it's more a discussion than only questions and answers. You start discussing, but if you have a comment, just go ahead with this, and we can uh, uh, do that. But I also think it could be interesting, because we have no idea, and this is the first day for us, I know that some more than half of you were here last week and you have been involved with the uh, uh, critical uh, Muslim uh, studies. What could be interesting, just very quickly, in, in a few seconds, and this is... I just want to ask a point of clarification. With the evaluation tools, yeah. would you like us to fill out? We're happy to give some evaluation to you from the morning. I know we're from the other course, but we think it might assist you if you could give some time. That's all. If you want, that's fine. If you want to do it, that's good. Uh, so if you can have you are not obliged. Uh, the, the people coming for Kai, they have no choice. That's what they have to do. But you, you are, it's, it's good for us if you want to. Very good. So, uh, all the people who are not uh, from the, the, you know, the starting this week and you want to do that, just let us know and you might say this or let uh, uh, Antonio know that you are ready to do that. So, and it will be, of course, very good for us to have also uh, uh, things on that. Can we very quickly just you tell us name and where you are, you are coming from, the studies that you are doing, just to have a, and if you are with the, the, the you, it's your second week of your first week, can you just have a, a sense that who you are and what you are studying? Can we do that quite quickly for us to have a, we don't know, we are talking and we don't know who you are. So, if we can do that very quickly, but please, it's few seconds, it's now If every one of you is taking two minutes, that's over, we don't have a second. I'm sorry, we want, like, our background as well? Yes, a couple of seconds about who are you, what you are studying, where do you come from, and uh, second or first year. Please, please, please. My name is Aidan Khalid. I'm from the Islamic Human Rights Commission of the second week. I'm a Muslim Muslim Jewish Hi, uh, my name is Muhammad. I'm from Singapore. I'm studying comparative religion at the uh, National Islamic University. My name is Adam. I did two years of Islam studies ages ago. I'm an English teacher teaching English as a foreign language now. I'm on the Bernard Road. Uh, my name is Farouk, I'm from Singapore, I'm taking comparative religion in National Islamic in Malaysia, uh, and I'm in my first week in Nepal. Uh, my name is uh, Roberto, I'm one of the coordinators of Critical Muslim Studies, I'm a professor of uh, Chicago Chica Studies at San Diego State University. Start with your uh, 
there was one question here. One question who was raising. Say it again. I dealt with this. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So there is a uh, Sophia. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I have a question relating to this morning's uh, session about um, fiqh and uh, the, the Islam legal tradition. Uh, it's, it's a comment and question on this way. Um, on the one hand, we have Makasi, which is the objective, it's kind of above uh, everything that's something that we're directing ourselves towards, and we have the usul from which we are deriving the laws. But I feel that an, an area, uh, especially in, in, in the research I'm doing, that's being neglected is the assumptions um, on which things are based. Um, particularly if we're analyzing a uh, fact that's already been written, you know, um, like the, 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 the four methods. And I feel that we need to look at the epistemology. What assumptions were the jurists uh, basing themselves on when they don't fit, uh, particularly with regards to the social structures? Um, each jurist obviously was writing from a particular culture, a particular economic system, a particular social system like slavery, and there were obviously uh, gender structures in place. And uh, you know, we, we cannot just replicate um, that fit. Uh, in, in today's time, the system is radically different. So I think a uh, you know, Kyle should also be looking at the assumptions, um, as well as Makati and, and. Is this a question or a proposal? Mm -hmm. or a proposal, both. Both. <laughs> both. Okay. So we take more than questions or comments, and then we come to to answering it because it's going to be go ahead. <clears throat> I mean, two of the words that that you seem to feature in any of the presentations earlier this morning were colonialism and power, it possibly add a third one in this course. And that worries me a lot because what was presented um, by yourself and I think the Chef, second speaker, were what I would regard as very neat uh, taxonomies of knowledge, uh, framings regarding the tradition, and there didn't seem to be any problematization in the way that the system just made the first question was pointing to, I think. Questions of political economy regarding the formation of things like the Femme Canons. Um, what was the background? Why were institutions such as slavery um, like uh, endorsed, as it were, in a, new, in, in a somewhat nuanced fashion in, and included in the Canons, rather than questioned, challenged? And if they were challenged, why are those discourses kind of omitted from the presentation, in the sense we have this kind of potted history, which for me is best summed up as uh, Muhammad Muhammad Abdu projected backwards and forwards. So we have this kind of narrative that erases, for example, the contribution of the Shia, both Ishna Shari and Zaidi. Uh, we have we don't have any engagement with issues of power, uh, subaltern formations, hegemonic formations. Um, we don't have any questioning of, of the very fact narrative itself in terms of what, cons what are the basic constituents of that narrative and how that is inflected by considerations of power. And so the kind of um, feeling I got at the end of the presentation was that as a very open space was contracted and contracted and contracted by this idea that this is sacred and this has to be put aside. This is also sacred, and this has to be put aside. This is all, and so that the space shrinks down to uh, critical ishti had, and it shrinks to a point. And it's for me entirely unclear what that means, what the word critical means in terms of your project, vis-à-vis -vis the kind of ideas we've been exposed to in the first week of the critical Muslim studies program. Sorry for taking this so long. I know, and that's good. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Professor Ramadan, in your talk this morning, you spoke of the importance of understanding context, and I think an essential um, part of the legally relevant context is the uh, configuration of institutions that formulate, promulgate, and coercively enforce law. Several scholars have argued that the current conceptualization of law as statist, monist, and often codified is fundamentally different from the conceptualization of 
law in the uh, pre-modern Muslim polity within which the fiqh was developed. And so I'm wondering if your project also includes a more radical critique of the structure of the nation state and perhaps an alternative formulation of the relationship between law, polity, and sovereignty. Uh, in your presentation, Professor, you mentioned that one of the challenges uh, is uh, terminology to define definitions. Uh, how do you picture this process? Uh, if it is uh, which is doing uh, unification of uh, uh, definitions, uh, how much then the question is uh, the position and uh, well, let's say authority of how is recognized in the Muslim world uh, versus, for example, al University? If uh, uh, the practical aspect of this thing. And the second one, uh, you mentioned when you uh, we gave the definition of uh, universality of Islam, you said that it includes also the idea of taking gifts from other traditions, from other people. Who is making a uh, decision on what to take and uh, on what basis uh, uh, it should be decided what is good, what is bad, what to take, what not to take? as to the critique of colonialism itself when it comes to westernize our approach of the Quran. That's critical for me. What I see in some, especially, by the way, people are coming with very strong you know, discussion about power and colonialism. In fact, the way you, they, they, they deal with the Quran, for me, it's a colonized way in itself. So to speak about decolonization in a colonized way is where I think that we need to be very clear on that, that this is the position, and I, I'm ready to open the discussion on this, is to be clear that there is a revelation. This is why we think that this is part of the al -Aqida. Now, are you going to put the revelation in history the same way, to say this is the way we are critical? This is not what I'm going to, to, to do. But what I think is essential is anything which has to do with reading and constructing a legal tradition has to do with the context, the history, and power relationship. And sometimes the way things are perceived as no discussion about the way we are dealing with them is not going to work. So this is why I put from the beginning the double dimension of Ishtihad, which is be careful sometimes, and this is something which is important, when you read the Quran and uh, uh, you have the, the relationship in uh, Muhkamat, Ummul Kitab. So these are the foundations. So we are dealing with foundations. Now, anything which has to do with, with the way we read this is going to be a universal that we are extracting, but it doesn't mean that it's enough. It says why we have a double ishtihad. And this is what we talked about this morning when we were talking about Tahfiq uh, al-Mamad, which is achi achieving the purpose, is meeting the goals, is getting the intention in the way we are going to translate this in history. This is where we have to be very critical with the human construct in cultural term, historical term, and uh, uh, power relationship. And this is why I think that nothing in any of the school of law should be taken from granted. And more importantly, 
many of the scholars who today are going, as it was said about Usul al are today going to be critical very often is some, it's, it's, it's to assert something which was said by the scholars of the past. So we are confirming a position much more than criticizing an interpretation. So I think that this is clear, but this is where I would say there is a, 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 a principle here about the status of the scriptural. Uh, 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 and, and once again, in any of the colonial attempt to touch the heart of the <coughs> Islamic reference, it was about this. You want to touch the Muslim? Talk about the Quran. Make it clear that the Quran is just a book as the other books. And I see in leftist trends sometimes the relationship to the book is exactly the same. So I'm sorry to say sometimes to, to, to be westernized in the way you are dealing with de-westernization or decolonization is problematic. So I would say that I agree that we have to start with this, but being clear that where, where, where uh, 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 lies, uh, lie our principles. So, so this is one thing that's quite quickly about this, but I think that this is where uh, 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 I would start. And, and it comes to your question, I come to your question here, I can understand that uh, you might be uh, uh, not worried about questioning the, the methodology and the limits about what you said. But once again, what I'm saying here is that anything which has to do with, you know, I'm very much in everything which has to do with questioning power, the power relationship, and, and the, the, the human construct in the way. But once again, I'm doing this in the light of the reading of the text the interpretations, the historical interpretation. Now we have to agree, is this a book coming as a revelation in history, or is it the book to be completely historicized? If you may, you say it's, it's to, to be historicized, I'm not going to follow you. Why? Because this is an act of faith. So this is an act of faith. It's not only something that is coming from the critical thinking. I would say that to me, kalamullah means kalamullah. Now the way people are going to use that, the way people are going to use this, the way it was used, and we know this, in, in all the legal tradition, we had scholars that were working with power, they were, uh, uh, people who were uh, justifying slavery and justifying everything in the name, not of the text, but the relationship with power. So all this critique is something that is essential for us. Uh, uh, and it has to come from different uh, uh, angles, so, so uh, I would say, from a scientific angle, from a sociological angle, the political angle, uh, uh, or, or that dimension, I would say that it's a comprehensive approach. But I'm not, I'm sorry, I would say I'm not going to touch the status of the Quran. I'm opposing everyone who's going to come to me and say, the status of the Quran is problematic. I'm, I, I'm sorry, this is an act of faith. Go as you want, but I'm not going to touch it. I'm ready to talk about interpretation, not about the status of the Quran. And if I may just finish, and then they, they get, and we can start again the discussion, because uh, uh, so this is where uh, what I wanted to say about this. So what you were saying about the relationship between the, you know, uh, I wrote a book about beyond political Islam, and in the in the that book a, tech, a, a paper, and what I was saying is that if today. Anything that has to do with the political reference from an Islamic viewpoint is not going to tackle the, nation, the notion of nation-state. Today, we are not going to make it. I think it's critical. It's the way the nation-state is coming from a specific history that sometimes the Muslims are taking for granted. It says it is as it is. But no, the nation-state is not. But I would say, you know, in the book of uh, Wa and uh, Hala, uh, what you say, the, the impossible state, I think he's quite right on this. It's right. In fact, the problem is not the Islamic references, it's the state, it's the way we deal with the state and this notion of the state. So I would say that on this, we have to come to a very deep understanding, and this is why I come with this. No way, from an Islamic perspective, to, to talk about political power if we don't get the understanding of economic relationship, the cultural capital, the cultural power. All this has to be uh, uh, to be brought within the discussion to discuss policy, policy and law, because the legal fact. So I completely agree with this. But this is something where uh, we need to, to, to open the discussion from within the Islamic tradition, knowing that it's going to be the most difficult thing. Why? Because the supremacy of fiqh in this field made it, or made the political power, or the political structure the reference, and this is why we fall into something which is, let us talk about democracy. 
With Harvey Whitney, I, I, I said it from the very beginning, carry on talking about democracy, you are falling into the trap. That has nothing to do with the democratic process, it has to do with something else, which is it's, uh, the power, uh, the cultural and the economic power, and all the dimensions that we have to deal with, and I would say this is where uh, uh, we are critical. Uh, very quickly about the terminology, I think that this is a process where, uh, of course, you know, in science there is something that we can call objective terminology or the starting point, and I think in social sciences and all this, this is to be criticized. But at least if the discussion on terminology is going to help you where uh, lie the problems in the way you understand it. In fact, definition is getting your perception. So this is where we have to start to be critical. Even with the scholar, even with the scholar, when we were talking what was said this morning about bioethics, I was in the, in the, in the European uh, Commission on Bioethics, on, on ethics, not bioethics and ethics, and 80% of the problem were on definition. And who has the authority to tell what is the definition and how we deal with this from the religious perspective as, for, as, as much as from the, relig the, the scientific perspective? So the terminology is, uh, to, to, to define is to get some power. Power is in definition as well. So who is going to decide? This is also a process that we'll have uh, uh, from this interaction between scholars. Uh, uh, we need to have to come at least to an agreement in this discussion. Uh, we need to come to uh, operational agreement in the way we have to deal with this. Uh, when it comes, for example, to come with ethical answer to contemporary questions. You can't come with an applied ethics if you don't come to an agreement on some of this. So I would say in the shift of the, the center of gravity, the center of uh, 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 gravity or authority in Islam, uh, this is why we have to have this interaction. You cannot just come with you know, a closed legal world and a closed scientific world. So, so the question of authority is also to be uh, 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 put in the, uh, within the communities, within the Muslim communities, in the way they are challenging from within their field. But I would say that this is uh, 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 a question, as, as, as well as uh, the universality. It was, it was very quick that I said this this morning. My talk on universality is even deeper than that. But what I was saying is, there is something that we need to get. Universality is not at the end in Islam. Universality in Islam is at the beginning. It, in a very specific concept of human being, the fact that there is something which is called the fitra is at the beginning. In fact, you know the Sufi tradition telling you, leave the place you go, you are in, go there, and when you go there, you have the answer telling you, the answer is where you live. You know, this is all what the alchemist took from. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, he took yeah. this from the Sufi tradition. He took this one, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajaun. From him, we, we, we start and we come back to him. And in fact, fitrah is something that this is why, in fact, deep down, we are very optimistic and open to everything which is coming from human rationality, as long as we reconnect this to fitrah. So universality is not only to take from other, it's to come back to the universal intimate concept of human being. It's, it's the way we deal with this. And I would say that the missing part of everything which has to do with epistemology and science in the Islamic discourse is a discourse on the concept of human being from an Islamic perspective. I think that this is even uh, 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 not there in our discussion. What he was, uh, uh, Rahman was saying about the spiritual thing, it's the spiritual liberation, the way we decolonize spirituality. I would say the Muslims should have, should be involved in all this discussion about spiritual liberation before talking about political and economic liberation. And even this has to be decolonized. So I don't know. So, so just, just one comment about the last uh, um, uh, explanation. Uh, if we are taking uh, uh, the of human beings uh, into the picture of uh, uh, deriving uh, what is good and bad uh, and uh, or coming to universality, it still there is a um, religious perspective. Because uh, if uh, you are talking from circular perspective of uh, circular people, what is good and bad, it will differ drastically from uh, what you and I and what lawyers. That, 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 that's a very good point. It comes back to the beginning. <coughs> comes back to the beginning. In Islam, there is fitra, but there is no fitra without the Quran. And this is why you have nurun ala nur. But to get the first, you need to get the second. Without the Quran, for us, 
We can trust the FITRA that the Quran is essential. You can't do only with your FITRA. You can't do because without the Quran, it means that you don't understand the very essence of the, the, the prophetic missions throughout history. This is why it's part of Al-Aqidah. It's part of the Al-Kitab wa Al-Rusul. That's essential. It's part of what we believe. So I, I wouldn't say I'm not going to compromise on this just for the sake of uh, being open. But let's not being open. This is being lost. Yeah. Yeah. So you have questions. So I, I don't have questions. You have lots of things about I cannot also <laughs> have to, uh, I have to confess my ignorance sometimes. So I, I, I noted two points to comment on them. The, the question about assumptions and the, the question about uh, context and uh, what did the Muslim religious scholars do with uh, slavery, etc. Uh, and I will use examples most of the time from the field of biophysics. Uh, about uh, assumptions, uh, when we read the, the, the uh, vast uh, amount of literature available in the Islamic law, uh, the more we read and the deeper we go, we knew for sure there were assumptions. And uh, even much more than assumptions, there was a system that people were working through. We can even speak about theories in different fields. But of course, you need to read a huge amount of literature in order to um, uh, decipher what they were speaking about. Uh, for instance, when it came to uh, medical ethics, uh, they had clear assumptions about science about medicine, about medical knowledge that was available to them. And we had, uh, on the other hand, clear and more clear and more crystallized assumptions about uh, religion, about scripture, about the Quran, and about the Sunnah. And the more the biomedical knowledge becomes available to them, uh, the more complicated these assumptions and how to reconcile them it becomes. Uh, I, I wrote recently an article about uh, uh, how Muslim religious scholars uh, reacted to a theory on embryology, the development of the embryo in, in, the, in the uterus uh, between the 13th and 2nd, 16th centuries, throughout three centuries. Uh, there was a theory for Hippocrates that was developed. Uh, by Avicenna and later by other uh, Muslim physicians like Al-Baladi, Yahya Al-Baladi and others. Uh, but it came to its uh, more or less uh, final phase at the hand of some uh, Jewish physicians uh, at the end of the 12th century. And then it went through uh, to the books of Muslim religious scholars. And then they had to handle with this because the Quran and the Sunnah speak also very clearly about the development of the embryo. It was very interesting because what the, uh, what the, 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 biomed the, the medical knowledge uh, uh, made available to them from Hippocrates to the Jewish physicians in the 12th century uh, do not correspond to what the Quran and the Sunnah says, or at least the understanding of the Muslim religious scholars before the 13th century. So it was a difficult uh, thing and we had to, do, to, to deal with it. How, how should we uh, deal with this? And clearly, when you read their literature, you see uh, what kind of assumptions that they have about revelation. For instance, uh, they said that in the Quran, uh, we have uh, evidences whose uh, meaning uh, is fine. They are not open to different interpretations. And uh, here, we, we have no space whatsoever. We have to take them as they are, otherwise we betray the message of the revelation. But even uh, to the uh, verses uh, which are open to more than one interpretation, here was the main difficulty. Because uh, even the, the possible interpretations, they are categorized. So if we have a Quranic verse or a prophetic uh, statement open, let's say, to five or six interpretations, these six interpretations, you cannot choose them randomly. There is number one, and there is number two, and there is number three, and number five, six, etc. And you move from one to two only if you have a karina, or they call a karina, compelling evidence. Something which compels you to move from the first to the second. And the question was, when science can be this compelling evidence? When? What kind of probability, what kind of certainty 
uh, 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 will, um, uh, should it be in order to move from 1 to 2 or to 5 or 10 or 12 or whatever? There are clear assumptions about this, and there is very sophisticated uh, mechanism uh, for dealing with this. I say in, in the, in now we have to uh, be very uh, um, aware uh, of these assumptions. Because now, for instance, if you want to speak about abortion, uh, there, are, there is a classical Islamic law, pre-modern Islamic law, and we have so many opinions about whether abortion can be possible or not. And we think, or most of us think, uh, that we have to follow these opinions or to choose at least one of them uh, because they are part of the tradition. They have checked the Quran, the Sunnah, they know this better than us, but uh, they, they based their conclusions on assumptions concerning science as well, not only the Quran and Sunnah. So when we see opinions in the Hanbali and the Hanafi school clearly stating that uh, abortion is possible uh, before 120 days, even without any single reason. Shouldn't have reason at all. But why did they say this? Not because of only of a specific reading of the uh, scriptural references in the Quran and Sunnah, but because of a, a, a scientific medical assumption. They said, and it is clearly mentioned in their arguments, uh, that before breathing the soul, uh, the baby, um, uh, the fetus, is an accumulated piece of blood. Damun munatu. It's like an extra finger in the hand of the mother that she can cut any time. So there is no life whatsoever before breathing the soul. No, no, this is not the case. By medical knowledge at this time, maybe we understood it in this way, but now we know this is not the case. So these opinions must be excluded. We cannot say that this is part of our tradition. We have to take them out of our We rejected them because we are faithful to the tradition that they were faithful to at that time. And here I come to the issue of context. When we read the religious scholars from the 10th or 11th or whatever century, we shouldn't treat them as if they are li living with us now, and we blame them as if they are with us now. So al shatibi was in Granada, but he was not in the 21st century. He was in his own time. So if al shatibi is speaking about uh, slavery and slaves, for instance, there was no universal declaration of human rights at this time. It was a completely different context. They were fighting and competing uh, empires or caliphates or whatever you like. There was completely different context. So you read them in their context, be, be very clear about this, and then aware of the different context that we speak about. In, in, in the whole paradigm of Islamic tradition, we have differentiations between people based on belief, Muslims and non-Muslims. There are a huge number, hundreds, thousands of rulings which differentiate between people because if, if he is Muslim, then it's like this. And if he or she is not Muslim, it's like this. The same with gender. If it is a woman, then this. If it is a man, it is this. And on freedom, slaves and free people. Even the outer, etc., the private parts, what are the limits of this? It's all based on this. If you are going to, if you want to check a ruling based on this paradigm, you cannot take one ruling only and then you say, okay, then this has to achieve. No, you have to take the whole paradigm. If you want to check the gender issues, and to say that uh, half of the inheritance is not fair because it is uh, half for the man and uh, uh, the, uh, double for the, uh, half for the woman, double for the man. Okay, uh, I, I agree that you do this, but you do everything. Not only this part. You take the whole paradigm and then we try to reshuffle it and to say what will remain, what will get out. But not taking one, uh, uh, one thing. The same for freedom, the same of, uh, for uh, belief. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just I wanted just to stress one point about the, um, the, the 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 things that are immutable in Islam. I don't know. Often uh, people think that to to be critical and to be a reformist, you have to uh, you have to be critical about what is immutable about everything. Actually, this is not the case because. Uh, in Islam, there is this immutable framework 
And if you want, if you want to be critical to, to the fiqh or to the Torah or to the, to the texts, then we have to use the tools, the right tools, and the right qawaid uh, that are established. And one of these tools is that there, there is a part that is This is part of, else what, is it, what are the tools that you will use? What is the parameter that you will use to, to, to be critical to the text? If you don't use, because the, 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 the text has their nature. If you, if you are studying, I don't know which matter, you have to respect the methodology to approach this matter because this methodology depends on the nature of the mat matter that you are approaching. It's the same th thing for the text. They have a nature and they have a methodology which allows you to approach them. Uh, and from this methodology is, is the fact that this text, the Sharia, is based on a on an, on an, um, balance between Thabit and Mutagayyid. Thabit is the immutable framework that guarantees that Islam stays authentic. And Mutagayyid is this. Uh, this changeable part that guarantees that Islam stays universal because without an immutable uh, part after a few centuries Islam won't be Islam anymore it will be another religion something else because it's so immutable that you can do make from it whatever you want and without this flexible and this changeable part Islam will not be um, universal because it will not be applicable anymore because everything is just immutable. So, so this is the balance that, and, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the balance in everything and, and in Sharia we have this balance. This is one of the rules and, and one of the, the, the major things to approach the text. And this, it, it doesn't mean that you're not, you can be critical, but you have to be critical in, with the methodology and, and with respecting the nature uh, uh, of the text. So, so um, as a center, I think, our purpose is to be critical to the to the uh, uh, to the legacy, to be critical to the text, but with respecting with the respect of, of the rights of the nature of the text. And our approach, especially, I, I mean, if, if we if we are talking about um, assumptions, there are assumptions in the fiqh, but you have to know one thing that there is when there is ma'lum and the darura, when there is a consensus of the scholars, that means that there is an immutable text there is an immutable text it, it, there, can, it can, there can be an ijma and consensus if there is not something that is clear and that we can't diver diverge upon if, if there is not a clear text that we can that we can diverge upon we will diverge anyhow so this assumptions if there are assumptions if there are assumptions, and is, if the ishtihad is based on assumptions, that means that there will be divergence. 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 It means it will be divergence. So, so you are not, this is not binding. This is not binding. You, you, you don't have to stick to this opinion. You can, you, you can deconstruct this opinion, but, but with respecting the rules of deconstruction and of ishtihad. Okay, it seems that uh, lots of reaction. So go ahead, and then we, we try to take five. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that for us to have a creative new history hand or um, a methodology. I mean, <coughs> in, the, in the assumption that we need a methodology that allows for a new creative history hand, aren't we omitting the fact that? Yeah, I mean, it, people do ijtihad all the time. When you're reading the Quran, if you don't have access to expert advice, you do ijtihad. Am I right? Or, or is it the case that, I mean, some people have the right to do ijtihad? Or why? So, okay, so my question is, if only some people have the right to do ijtihad, who? And um, I need to be convinced that it's wrong. Uh, I, I'm, so I'm not convinced that it's wrong to not study the last 1,500 years of fiqh um, in order to make a judgment. So please say something. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I like, I like the way you are putting your question. <laughs> Say something. Okay. We'll try. Promise. Yes. You, you, the three of you, so go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be brief. I actually did not want to ask this question um, because based on how I look, I felt that um, I will be framed as uh, the white feminist in the room, even though I am not. Um, but I will ask the question because nobody else is. So I want to make sure that I am clear. Is it that we have no women speakers because you have not found them? They do not exist. Um, they don't appear, they have not been educated enough, or what exactly is the reason that we have to have this? So, because, uh, <laughs> and in relation to that, given that we don't, perhaps, we can, perhaps you can say something about the ease with which we are speaking about abortion, IVF, etc., in a room full of women, um, by a group of men. Questions of authority and uh, decolonization come to mind in this setting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's like I kind of got a little thrown off, so I'll try to reboot. And thanks to uh, Brother Adam's question. Um, I think I have a few things to say. One is that um, it's kind of related as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The one is that, um, so as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the methodologies and the approaches to um, the Islamic sources um, are not things found in the sources. They're ways to, um, to evaluate the sources and from that extract things like Beck and, um, and um, various other questions about how to deal with the world um, and our spirituality and each other. I'm so sorry about my voice, by the way. I hope you can understand me. So, of course, we have the Islamic sciences, the traditional sciences that are constructed, um, or I'm sorry, that have been developed for centuries. Um, however, well, actually, let me put that aside for a second and add something that Adam said um, about power and authority. So like with the concept of Tawhid, as you all know, we submit to no authority, no systems of power and authority except for Allah. And of course, you know, as Professor Ramadan pointed out, we need the Quran to know what that submission means, right? So, so there's that. But if we have, if we have a religious scholar, and we have so many um, who are um, speaking with authority, they're coming from a place of authority, and usually they also are coming from a place of privilege. You know, we all have privilege in this room, even as we lack lots of privilege. We have the social mobility to um, acquire certain kinds of education, higher education, traditional Islamic education that others don't. So that's something to keep in mind. That informs our perspective as well because it because our experiences inform who we are and how we think and how we engage with um, ourselves and the world around us so um, as that is the case I think that it is um, personally I think that it is dangerous to not be teaching um, people how to uh, be truly literate which means to be critical thinkers how to critically evaluate texts, all texts, including our sacred sources. Um, we can't just rely on an, an authority, a religious scholar who is the authority, because then that replaces the Quran. So that's a statement, but it's also a question, because I would like you to respond to it. Thank you. I would just like for you to explain how the two concepts of um, collective ishtihad and consensus relate to one another. Earlier that day, you had uh, cited uh, Dr. Mohammed Alawali's presentation of environmental mm -hmm. ethics as a practical form of graphical formation. The problem, or the question I have is that in uh, Dr. Mohammed Alawali's uh, presentation, it was the thick integration of thick accommodation of modern Bible ethics. So that itself, in Asian African countries, is an imposition of a colonial ideology. 
So what about the, by the, at the cost of rejection and extermination of local medical or biomedical uh, knowledge? So FIC as a liberative exercise should be more at representing the indigenous rejected local knowledge than helping in imposing a Western discourse on the local population. Muslims or non-Muslims? What I mean is, even if the Muslims, majority of Muslims are outside the Arab world, like the African Asian countries, are non Muslims as well. No, but they are Muslims. The local population is speaking about. I think it's irrelevant if it is uh, Muslims. Like Islam is a liberating force, but it's liberating for everybody, irrespective of their Muslims or non Muslims. Liberating what? Sorry. Religion, you mean? Or no, liberating, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a world which is uh, dominated by uh, all people like Jews, so liberating for everybody. No, liberation should be from something to something. Yeah. From what? Liberation from what? I mean, what Authority, for instance? Yeah, from the discourse that is like maybe in Asian Africa, to be more specific, in Asian African countries, uh, Western medicine has been imposed at the cost of local indigenous medicine, or uh, the knowledge, which is more organic and more healthy and more natural. Um, so after your talk on questioning Islamic legal uh, tradition, I think we we add we add ask about um, aqidah and about how like the differences with that. And you said, correct me if I'm wrong, that basically you would start from the meaning and then you would find the fiqh and stuff, and it would lead to the way. Is that's how I kind of understood what you were saying? And I just feel like that's kind of counterintuitive because I don't understand how you can arrive at like the correct goals and purposes that you talked about if you don't have if everyone doesn't already have the same athlete who's looking at and like I think this room is a good example for you as an example some people in the room do think in their athlete that it is within their power to question sacred texts while other people don't think that be they think that because they submitted to Allah and his words that means you don't question the word and that's a like that's a big major issue of Aqidah between the two camps. So we can't go on to the Fiqh, we can't go on to anything else because we're divided on that. So I just don't understand how you can come to correct goals and purposes for Fiqh without, like through this induct, like deductive process. Through the what? Like deductive process of like the Fiqh first that will lead to the correct Aqidah. <coughs> So I think we go for that because it's a lot. <laughs> so the first question was for you. Well, she had yes, of course, I must start out and for Ange invites everybody to the uh, Azabar way and to do Tadabur. And Tadabur in Arabic, the Dubur is what's behind something. So Tadabur is is to look what's behind the verses. This is this is something that Allah asks to every single Muslim. But this is not the shihad. This is to 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 to, to um, ponder upon the Quran, and this is something personal between you and Allah. So this is something for everybody. But the shihad is something that is open for everybody. But there, so there is no uh, clerical uh, uh, institution or something. Everybody can become a mustahid but with the condition to acquire the tools which she had. So everybody, if, if you acquire, if you use the tool, the text, the sacred text ha has a nature. You have to respect their nature in order to approach them. And in order to approach them in the right way, you have to, you have to uh, uh, use the, 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 the right tool and have, to ri have the right understanding of approaching the text. So, so uh, else, on what will your understanding be based? What is the base of your understanding? By what will it be? Influenced, so 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 uh, this is the first this is the first condition. You can't be mushtahed, you can't push the but you have to you have to make, master the tools. And one of the one of the, the main uh, elements that is known by the mushtahed is that there is a red zone, there is an ishma, there is an ishma, there is a red zone that I can't cross because this is qatai. But I, we have to understand something also. There are immutable principles in the Quran. But the immutable is only in theory. In the practice, nothing is immutable. Every, everything becomes relative. Pork is haram, it's, not, it's prohibited. But in practice, it, it can become obligatory. 
when I'm, I'm dying, I have nothing else. It, it can become, and this is for this is for a lot of prescription, and this is what we call tahqiq al manat to to come from theory to practice to apply the principles. There is another ishtihad to go from the theory. So so here everything is relative because it, because the reality can make uh, uh, that that this principle is not applicable in this reality. But, but what dictates this part of the Shihad? It's, it's the, the tools are coming from the nature of the text. So it's the usul al fiqh the usul al fiqh is coming from the nature. And I mean, I can't approach it. Can you give me a concrete one, two, three, four? Can you give me a concrete example of, of, um, of, a, of an instance of each other? Of, a, of an instance of um, Ijtihad, where, or an instance of the nature of the text that you're describing. I don't, I don't get the question. <laughs> um, never mind that. No, no. What is an example of this thing that there's a baseline that I from that is somehow free, you know, any kind of social, political forces that are not in each man? You're saying you're, you're basing everything back in each man. Yes. As if there's no historical political process that leads to the as if we're not sitting in a room with just other traditions that lead to turn Islam and are still, you know, they have their own history and their own understanding. Why, why is there Ijma? How can Ijma? Take place. Ijma takes place when there is a text that is How can I know that something is that there, there is something that we call mutawatir. And you have the Quran is totally mutawatir, mutawatir, ma'nawi. Oh, afwan, tawatir daruri. That means that the whole text came from generation to generation to us with. Uh, a whole generation that 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 brought over the parentals. This is this is tawatr. In the Sunnah, we have tawatr daruri, but only in some parts of the Sunnah, like the way we pray. This is tawatr daruri because it, it's not one single person or two persons that transmitted this the way of prayer. It's whole generation. This is tawatr daruri also. And then we have in the Sunnah tawatr uh, 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 um, that is a theoretical tawatr. Or I may call this tawatr nazari. It means that we need a theoretical study of the chain to know if this chain is mutawatir. It means if this 100% right or is, this, is there a zone of, of doubt. So this is, this, is, uh, this is how we can know that the text is tawatir on, uh, or is immutable on the level of the uh, transmission. Then, qat'i tubud or qat'i dalala. Qat'i dalala, it means that there is only one understanding. How can we know this? We know this from two things. The, the text just can't mean anything else. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka asharatun kamila, you have to, to, to fast 10 days, you can understand something else, that it is 11 days or it is 9 days. We cannot we can only have one understanding. This is one, one, one way. The second way is that there is a tabafur. Tabafur in Musus, that, that means that there are so many texts that, giving, that are giving the same understanding that is not possible to have another another understanding. For example, the the, the, the fact that prayer is obligatory in Islam. This is a uh, uh, dalala because there are so many uh, texts that are showing this that there is no space here for different opinions. So this is this is an example. This is how we know that the, that, that there is the, this red line that is called ma'lumin al din darura because dalala. We have all these questions to, to respond. And if you start commenting on adding to this, uh, you want to say something? Uh, do you add something? Yes. Yeah, for, for Ijnihad, you have to study uh, uh, 15th century. It would be a good practice, but <laughs> I don't think it's possible. It's <laughs> interesting to try. Can you try that? Can you say that again, please? Yes, he, he said for ijtihad, it came to my mind, I found very interesting. Is it necessary to practice ijtihad that you have to study the legacy of 15 centuries before? I say it's interesting to try, but I don't think anybody can. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not possible. But 
it's also not possible to make it uh, chaotic uh, uh, in, in the field of politics, for instance. Uh, there are uh, institutional review boards, IRBs, not everywhere in the world. And now coming to the current world. IRBs, they decide what is right and what's wrong in the field of biophysics. And everybody has to listen to what the IRB said. If they said this article has unethical components, it will not be published. <coughs> if the uh, dissertation proposal uh, is un, uh, not, not, uh, not acceptable from an ethical perspective, it's not possible. It will not go through. And members in the IRBs, they have specific conditions which are known internationally. You have to follow specific courses. You have to <coughs> get a specific uh, level of knowledge. I think if you take it in any other discipline, it should be the same. If you want to speak about systemic thing, there must be. We can disagree what these are. Uh, how do we call these people? We call them fuqaha, we call them physicians, we call them intellectuals, whatever. It doesn't matter. I think we should agree that things should be regulated. Otherwise, no one will achieve anything. Uh, for uh, the female uh, speakers, and, uh, if, if they are there somewhere, we cannot find them, we are not willing to find them, or whatever. I, I think uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the religious scholars, uh, then we have to reshuffle the whole paradigm and come up with, with something else. This is uh, the thing that we, need to, that we need to do now. But just uh, criticizing them, they are good, etc., I don't think this will help uh, the people on the ground. Well, Thank you. Just to, to react to two questions that I had. The, the one that you, I will start with the last one because I, I think it's really important. And may I ask you something? For now and after, for the five days that we have, whoever you are, when you are in a critical thinking and we disagree on things, smiling, doing like this when you don't try to like the answer, that's, I think, the starting point of critical discussion is mutual respect. I see people reacting in a way of saying, hey, what is this? How are you, how, why are you reacting in such a way which is unpolite? I think that this is it. I, I, I really want, for me, I'm, 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 everything for me is about the way we are critical as much as you can, but out of respect. I'm not going to answer somebody who's doing like me and say, oh, so silly. So you perhaps you don't ask the question, I can leave. But this is mutual respect. As much as we are respecting the students or respecting our colleagues, you respect also, and this is a critical discussion. But uh, uh, I think this is the starting point of critical discussion. And Muslims, even though if you are radical, be radical and polite. <laughs> uh, radical and polite is good as well. So that's one point. The second thing that I wanted to say is what you said, which is the starting point of our discussion. When we talk about the aqidah and you know the six pillars of, of our Iman. It's true that this is the starting point of everything. We have to be clear on this and we have to be, because this is where in Nusus Qataya we are relying on, on, on the immutable, undisputable verses of the Quran or a Hadith. And it has an impact on everything. What I was saying this morning is not this, is we have to set an Aqidah, yes. But then when you go with fiqh and when we go with the legal tradition, we always have to come back to this. Because in fact, the way we are dealing with the, the objective, the way we are dealing, is coming back to the very essence. No discussion about the legal tradition within, within history without coming back to al-aqidah. Which, for example, means something very simple. You, if you don't get the very essence of you, Believing in God, understanding the trust, and understanding that you are a vicegerent, which is the khilafa in the very, you know, uh, 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 the first uh, etymological meaning, not it was the way it was. It is used by some political trends. It's a, a, the vicegerent is very much something which is essential. You know, for example, when I was uh, writing about this, and if you come back to a shariati or you come back to the uh, leftist tradition, saying, be careful. You don't have the ownership of, of the world. You are only here to deal with it. This very essence of Al-Aqidah has an impact on fair or sort of fair on the object, of course. So it's a two-way process. So we need to set this, but also to come to a point where we need to get the consequences of this. Why I'm saying this, every time I'm challenged, 
by Salat literalists. They would say exactly the same. They would say, we need to start with the Tawheed wal Aqidah. They are right. But the way they are dealing with this, in the way they are dealing with Fiqh, and the understanding of the framework Fiqh, and the objective is not the same. So it's not enough to agree on this. You need to have it everywhere. So in fact, Aqidah is uh, crossing the world. It's everywhere. It's in fact the light of transdisciplinary approach. For me, this is it. So, and this is why, for me, it's a liberating process in itself. When, for example, I come back to, to the Tawhidi uh, reference, and when I'm dealing with culture and the liberating process, I don't want to speak about liberation in Western terms. I want to, to talk about liberation in two, uh, three dimensions. The first is the way I'm connected to God, the second, the way I'm connected to myself, and the third, the way I have to change the world. But not in the way it's just a question of culture and, and it's, it's Western terms. Because I see somebody, people, some people who are so much dealing with liberation from the colonized or the colonizing framework that they are jailed in the liberation understanding. If you understand what I mean. Jailed by the framework itself. And this is the point that I had with Edward Said. I was very much with him, but I think that in everything he wrote about Orientalism, the way he talks about Islam is westernized. The people who he's referring to are people who are westernized. Himself. So he's saying about going against you know, the, 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 the Occident, uh, 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 the, the uh, Orientalism, and say, okay, who are the people you are referring to? These are people who are. I have a problem with these people. These people are entering in the framework. So I think that uh, go for uh, the, 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 the critical discussion that we had about Islam. Uh, and I, I saw this with myself. I saw him having a problem with me because I was too much involved in the Islamic tradition. I said, okay, I have a problem. Are you talking about Orientalism? Or are you yourself having a framework which is coming from somewhere? which in fact is not enough. So criticizing Orientalism with some hints coming from the Oriental thing are exactly the same with culture and liberation. I think that this is a problem. This is why I would say that your question is critical. I would say it's a two-way process, but we need to have it everywhere. The second thing that I wanted to say very quickly about, uh, 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 so I started with this, about uh, what you were saying. You, you need to get us right in the way we are trying. So you can be very radical in your criticism. And, and we know what are the priorities. Now, the fact that we are only men, I, I don't think that you can judge a process through uh, uh, the people who are here. And it's not because there are men talking that's pro a, a problem in itself. As long as we are putting our priorities and our vision in a clear way. For example, saying, and this is something that I wrote uh, uh, 20 years ago about, Yes, there are differences between the way women are reading the scriptural sources and men. That's for me clear from the beginning. I have a problem with scholars saying this, but I think that this is, the, this is the problem. Now, I have met so many women, the way they read the text is not very different from men, and is even worse than that. It's going just to assert themselves as being part of the tradition. So it's a long process. It's a very long process where we need to get this. And I'm sorry, when you speak about abortion and you think, oh, why men are, we have to talk about this. I won't be involved in this discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. Why, why is it a women's issue? Mm -hmm. why, why are you saying this? Why, why is your assumption saying why you men are, I want to talk about this. Because we are involved in the thing, by the way. And then more and more. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's a very I'm not joking, that's for sure. No, no. And the rest find this entertaining. I particularly do not. No, 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 but what I'm saying, no, what I'm saying is that I don't see why you are having this assumption that when it comes that are men. So I think that the radical critique of the way we are dealing with some issues, we also have to deal with two things. First is the, the historical processes and where we are studying and are, what our priorities, what we are trying to say and the way we are trying to move. The radical stance that we may have, also we have to deal with steps to which we are going towards a, 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 a transformation in the way we are putting even the problems. The second thing is uh, we also have to deal with some of the issues. For me, when I'm saying that we are talking about gender, which is men and women, it's not only women, I don't want to do anything to have with only women's thing. And this is why I was advocating in the book, and once again I was criticized, Islamic feminism. And I was involved with women on this. 
But my point is that today and for the future, we need to come together, womanhood and manhood together. I want to talk about men because I really think, and this is it. No, 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 Most of the time we talk about men. I don't think we have anything to worry about in that sense. So, I think that's wrong. I think you are completely wrong. I think you are completely wrong and we have to speak about men and I think that the most important crisis within Islam is men is not women. But that's, that's <laughs> not issue. Sure. That's, that's the same thing. Yeah, no, 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 but, yeah, no, 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 but men are oppressed. It's, it's not. Mm -hmm. I agree. Look, look at me. Look, yeah, look at your reaction. Say? What that's, can I I'm say? So, when I'm a so master so sits and tells, I'm sorry. When, when somebody in a power when, position tells somebody who is systematically, societally, a place, I can tell you this, I mean, in the most liberal societies, it, it, it's, it's a systematic oppression. And to tell me that, um, that uh, we come, that we come to this place from the same position is simply untrue. You said that. Well, you're saying, you that. I, I, did I say that we don't need to talk about men? Obviously, we need to talk about men. I actually, your, your, uh, Sadiq, your friend, I, I appreciated his answer very, very much. And I, I thank you. I think it's very um, respectful. And, and well, I that's, think. That's quite, that's quite no. smart, but that's not the point. No. You're reacting to me the way. No, uh, okay, I, I, don't, don't, I don't want to have no, everybody, the, you know, no, the, 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 the way you are here, even the way you were listening to me right now, it's just exactly what. Uh, uh, was the problem when I started. But I just want to tell you, you can be pleased with our answer. Let us all see, uh, also speak our mind and tell you the way we are putting it with the thing. But straight away to say, oh, once again you are in a position of power and you say this, I think this is problematic. We also have to be critical in the way you are putting the question itself. That's I, what I, I want to say. I would like to comment. Uh, a little, oh, no, no, just a little, a little, a very little, very little. This is why you're talking about the Today it was about Manhajiya. Gender is on Thursday, but once again, we have to talk about it. So we still have time for all three questions, maybe. So people who didn't ask questions. Was the question I asked, I guess. Yes, yes, it answered. Was my name Karen? And you, your question was about? There was also one question about consensus and collective share. That is an answer. One about uh, local populations and hegemony of Islamic legal discourse or something. I think that might have been my <laughs> Sorry, it's okay if we miss it. No, no, let, let me. Was it to me? It was kind of to everyone. <laughs> Mostly perhaps to uh, Sheikh Lazar. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name. Sheikh Lazar. Okay. Was it to Sheikh no, we can you, talk after. It's I only okay. remember that okay. your voice was not so okay. You apologized for this. <laughs> I remember. Well, thank you very much, right? <laughs> uh, uh, let me uh, uh, address you my question. Uh, is consensus uh, collective ishtihad? No. 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 Uh, collective ishtihad is a way to delineate the majority opinion. Because with the, uh, in, uh, introducing questions about bioethics, uh, fragmentation of opinions was a really serious problem. In the 50s, when you ask religious scholars, 100 religious scholars about what does Islam say about organ transplantation, you get 110 opinions. So it was very difficult to bring them together. So the way collective is there to bring people together and to come to an opinion or to or see, to minimize the disagreement. But it is not consensus because in the collective uh, meetings, uh, no, all uh, scholars, intellectuals, theologians, they don't come from everywhere. You cannot do this. So it's a majority, but not consensus. Uh, about the issue of um, uh, 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 local populations and the way of medical treatment, which can be more healthy and more uh, positive than the Western way. So are we moving from uh, one system to another and still victimized in between? That I think uh, you are under the influence of the technology of Islamic medicine. That medicine, that medicine also can be Islamic. But this is problematic, to, to my mind at least, because there, there are conferences made by the, the institutions that I spoke about in the morning, and they were dedicated five conferences at least in Kuwait entitled Islamic Medicine, International Conference on Islamic Medicine. 
and they try to uh, uh, give the, the stamp of Islamic to specific medical treatments. That this is Islamic and this is not Islamic. And by the way, m most of them were coming from uh, South Asia uh, and from Pakistan and India, and they said that this is more Islamic than the West Coast. But, uh, but this is another no, issue. The Quran is mm. not the point that what yes. I was making. So, there is a, a, an important trend now saying, mm -hmm. look, all what is coming from the medical uh, uh, Western understanding is mm -hmm. uh, uh, chemical uh, medicines and not taking into account everything which is cultural and the very old cultural <coughs> tradition dealing with body, dealing with even the spiritual side of it and, and everything which is rooted in the tradition. And the big question is, by being so involved in contemporary issues on bioethics, are we not promoting the Western medicine versus the very old cultural traditions. In fact, by imposing the way we deal with medicine, which is against the, 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 the indigenous cultural uh, uh, medicine. And this is a critical discussion that very often, yes, the scholars this are so... Is this what you mean? Is this what you mean? I'm the translator. No, I, misunderstood. <laughs> I have to say, I misunderstood the question. But then, it's no, we, we are on the same page. Then there, there is no problem. We are on the same page because because the, 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 uh, when we speak about Islamic bioethics when it comes to medical treatment, we, we speak about compatibility with the main tenets within the Islamic tradition. We don't speak about prescribing a medicine to uh, the body, because this is, this is medicine, this is, this is not religious. But the issue is how to, uh, uh, Ibn Sina, uh, in his um, uh, textbook, about which he, he made it also as poetry, he said, "Al-Tibbu, Hibru Sihatin, wa Buru Sakamin, something like this. It's, it is it is preventive and uh, treating a disease when it happens, preventing it before it happens, and treating it when it happens. Uh, how this is this is this is medicine. This is this is not religion. So, uh, but when people." When people come to uh, 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 want to ask about the compatibility of what they do with the Islamic tradition, then it becomes a religion. Then it becomes a religion. So, I think just, I, yes. I don't want to take more time. I don't want to take more time. No, no, but the point that you are making, because this is, we are at the forefront. I think that we moved in the Islamic methodology by having this you know, collective ishtihad. The problem that is missing here is that we need sometimes in this collective which have people coming from the cultural side of the spectrum by also questioning the fact that we take for granted that the dominant medicine is the only one. And then we try to come with answer, ethical Islamic answer in Islamic applied ethics, but we don't come with something which is coming from the very old tradition, which is not Islamic medicine, it's cultural, effective, efficient, indigenous medicines that we have to bring. And this is where we have to do exactly the same well, medicine. I didn't mention knowledge as well, but it wasn't, wasn't mentioned to us specifically. Yes, but, but the point is it's exactly the same in all the fields. The problem here is our relationship to Western knowledge is problematic from the Islamic understanding. From the, by the way, not only from the Islamic majority countries, for all the thousand countries. So and even the, the everywhere. Anyway. So so I think that this is why we have to come with this this uh, this uh, critical discussion about uh, this is where the cultural power, the the, the very deep understanding uh, has to do. So this is why we are talking about transdisciplinary. But it cannot be only physicians and scholars. No, but don't forget that as I said, in the perception of the contemporary religious scholars. Medicine is Western. So, so all the physicians who come to these meetings are trained in the Western system. So they are not critical to the Western system in this sense. They are critical to it that it may be against religion, etc., religious pres uh, prescriptions. So, so, so the Pethi guilty about the lady who sent the question and we didn't get it. Can you say a few key words? <laughs> okay. Um. I think it was phrased a little bit better before, but it was basically about um, the fact that extracting knowledge from the, the methodologies we have for extracting knowledge from the Quran are um, methodologies that we as humans have constructed using, you know, our phone and whatnot. Um, and that I was, uh, oh, I was saying that my personal belief is that we we can't have ijma if we have. Um, 
I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but we can't have consensus in the community if we have only a few people who are able to um, to consult, right? To consult the sources. So one was a comment that I think that we ought to be um, engaged in public education um, in teaching uh, you know people, adults and especially children, how to be Quran literate and and, li and like literacy, I define as um, knowing how to discern methodologies and critically evaluate texts. Um, and that, what else was it? Oh right, like I was saying that the concept of Tawheed is that we submit to no systems of power and authority except for Allah. Oh, yeah, so, okay. You said something, yes, you said something about that uh, we are putting men... Uh, no, I didn't say uh, males. I didn't... No, men, uh, no. <laughs> I didn't say anything about that. I could, but I didn't. Humans. <laughs> <Human. laughs> <Human. laughs> <Human. laughs> <Human. laughs> We, we give the authority to humans instead of the Quran. Well, I'm saying that if yes. we don't know how to, for example, if one of you says something and it you know, sounds pretty good, and we're supposed to consider you, you are an authority, of course, and we, and we consider you that, then we should follow it. However, we, if we only take religious scholars um, as the authority without knowing how to um, critically evaluate their uh, stance or their arguments, we don't, uh, we don't know how to discern their methodology, and we're only supposed to follow what they say. I think in the lecture, I think, um, uh, Dr. Aboli, you might have said that, um, that, you know, that, like, for fit is the final answer, which is fine. However, if we listen, if we just blindly follow a, a human as an authority without knowing how to discern for ourselves, then we're replacing your authority with the authority of the Qur'an, which means then we're submitting to you as the Qur'an instead of Allah. You know what I mean? In no way am I saying that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. I'm just saying that, you know, we, that it's not that simple that, you know, I'm, you know, learned and educated, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even, and I have, like, I've had privileges in my life and social mobility when others don't, and you should listen to me. That was it. Yes, I think there was, um, if, if I said that the fiqh uh, should have the final word, or has the final word, then uh, it should be a mistake on my side. Uh, what I mean I is that in the that. Islamic tradition, final in the sense that the last step. Mm -hmm. So we, we have theology, we have philosophy, we have medicine, etc. At the very end of the process, the jurists come to say if this is okay mm -hmm. or not. The, the, if I said this, this is what I, then this is what sure. I meant. Not that the final word, the two one, can compete with what we have. Uh, uh, one of, personally, I find very beautiful in the Islamic tradition is that uh, no one has binding authority. No human being after the Prophet ﷺ has a binding authority. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter if he is the most important religious scholar, if he has the highest position in the Muslim world, or uh, whatever, it is an advice. It is an advice, and I, as a Muslim individual, uh, I can uh, look, ask more than one person if I don't have the capacity to go through the text on myself, or I go through the text and ask. The, the, I, I think this is one of the very beautiful things in Islam. The religious scholars cannot be dictators. Religious scholars can be dictators um, only in, uh, when um, uh, when ignorance prevails in society and when they are mobilized by, by politicians. But generally speaking, the religious scholars, they just give advice. And the authority of the religious scholars stems from their uh, 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 intellectual power to convince the people. If they cannot convince the people, why would they be important religious scholars? They wouldn't be. They wouldn't be. They can write whatever they like, say whatever they like. But they have no authority in society. We, uh, uh, now we study the people that we study because they could convince, they could uh, make some changes in the, in, the, in, the, in the mind of the Islamic tradition. They did this not because uh, a specific uh, ruler appointed them, but because they could convince the masses. They represented the Islamic tradition by this. And I would say anyone who fulfills this rule will have the authority.
we call them intellectual, we call them religious scholar, we call them faqih, it doesn't matter. And anyone who wants to work within the Islamic tradition, this is the mechanism. This is the mechanism. No one can say, in the name of God, I tell you, it's like this. I, I can, if, if there is a religious scholar who said this, let me know. But I cannot imagine anyone says this. Or clean, yeah. Sorry, it's uh, uh, 6 uh, 30 and we have another appointment, so we have to stop here. We have tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock, we'll start with uh, uh, the first lecture, and it will be on politics with the poor. Uh, uh, so you know what you are exposed to now. Uh, uh, so I, 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 at 9 o'clock. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.